Uh, I'm Ellen Leipson. I'm the director of the Center for Security Policy Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome you. But I'm going to step aside now and turn to our Dean, Mark Roselle, uh, to make it, uh, the welcoming remarks on this uh, very important webinar. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Ellen. And welcome to all to this webinar on the Suez Canal accident and its larger implications for trade and security. Very timely. Our Center for Security Policy Studies examines a wide range of international security topics through these occasional webinars and hopefully soon public events at the Shar School in Arlington. And I can tell you, we all very much look forward to that getting together again in person. CSPS also conducts deep learning exercises for our graduate students from crisis simulations and national security site visits to a research forum for doctoral students. Today's event takes a cross-disciplinary look at the recent crisis, the Suez Canal accident that created a costly logjam for the global supply chain. The topic is relevant to our degree programs in international commerce and policy, led by Professor Ken Reiner, and international security master's degree program that is directed by Professor Leipson. The Suez accident did not result in a serious security incident, but it was a wake-up call about how major companies and national security actors have to prepare for such contingencies. So I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today, especially pleased actually, Dr. Jill Ruff is Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Center for Security Policy Studies. She holds a PhD in public policy from George Mason University and she was a surface warfare officer in the US Navy and is now in the Naval Reserves. She served in Afghanistan and led the research for the National Commission on Military, National and Public Service. And most importantly, she was in the past my teaching assistant in the Shah School at George Mason University. So Jill, thank you for moderating today's session. And I'm now gonna turn the session over to you to present the panelists. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean. I appreciate it. Uh, of the many things you offered, I think uh, the being a proud George Mason alumni is certainly at the top of the list. So I'm very, very excited to be here today to facilitate this discussion. And I think it's a really important one that we're having. So uh, a couple technical uh, notes just for the audience, if you're listening online, uh, we are going to be using uh, the Q&A function. So when we get to, we're going to have a facilitated conversation, but I'd love to involve the audience later on in this discussion. So please put your questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom webinar platform. You'll see it right down there and drop your questions in. You can direct it to any particular panelist or an open question for all of our panelists. So I'll be um, going through those towards the end of the discussion. Uh, but what I'd like to do right now is sort of just, again, introduce our, our our panelists as we go through and allow them to have some opening comments, then we'll have an interactive discussion on this very important topic. Uh, to the Dean's point and uh, Director Leipson, this is interdisciplinary. So often what we find is that the security policy community doesn't necessarily talk to the international commerce community. What we wanna do is bring those groups together and really have a, a discussion on what might be a very underappreciated aspect, uh, maritime security, um, but extremely important. So let me start with Brent Sadler. Brent is the Senior Fellow for Naval Warfare and Advanced Technology at the Heritage Foundation. So Brent, I'm gonna ask you to kick us off with a, a sort of a broad opening question. Could you talk through sort of how the maritime security community thinks about uh, the full range of effects uh, of an, a grounding like we just saw with Ever Given in the Suez Canal? And then also, you know, are there more immediate threats that we are concerned about? Uh, this was an accident, we can talk more about that one. It was man-made, but what is, what is the range that you're thinking of as a maritime security expert? Well, thank you very much, uh, Jill, and also a fellow uh, shipmate, Navy uh, alumnus. Uh, I was a submariner for 26 years and been pretty much all over the world, but most of my time was in the Pacific. And just to kind of maybe first kind of lay down the geography from a naval, a navalist perspective, you've got choke points. Uh, and some of those are man-made like the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal and others are historical but natural geographic features like the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus going into the Black Sea. In this case, the Suez Canal, man-made, uh, a connector, a strategic for several hundred years, strategic waterway that connected Europe, Western Europe with 
the uh, South Asia, India for a long time, and also now very importantly with the markets in, in the Far East. From a navalist perspective, and, and this was again really something very critically looked at during the naval strategy of the 80s against the Soviets, was the implications of moving forces from the Pacific or to the Pacific from the Atlantic fleet, depending on where the crisis might be. If it's North Korean, it's a flow to the Pacific. If it was a communist surge through the plains of Fulda in Germany, then it was a surge from the Pacific into uh, the European theater. And so there was a lot of analysis done, uh, but it's that was the American experience, which is the more recent one. And things have changed to an extent. Uh, the seaways are much more crowded, uh, not just with naval vessels and commercial tankers, but also with uh, large fleets of open ocean fishing boats as well. And along comes with that as a, there's an infrastructure weight that's gotta be considered. And so navalists do think about that probably not as much as they should, which is why I wrote the article as soon as I could after when, you know, I didn't wanna write while the dust was still floating on the Ever Given's grounding in, uh, in the 23rd of March and then when things started to clear out on the 2nd and 3rd of April. Uh, but I wanted to kind of let a little bit of the dust to settle, but not too much to basically First off to my fellow navalists to say, hey, there's more to this than what you might be thinking of a classic choke point. Uh, and the other part of your question, I think, is a really consequence management, which I hope we can get into more in depth. And that's another part of the a concern for the Navy is if these choke points are obstructed, secured, blocked, how long to either clear that blockage or to go around? And in the case of the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal, you're looking anywhere from five days to seven days. Now that's different than a commercial. And that's probably, I'll leave that to other panel members to discuss more at or we can come back to. But uh, for a crisis, if there was something that went down, went sideways, that's a lot of time when, when, when violence is occurring on the ground or even at sea uh, to get forces to that front. And that, that could win or lose a situation. In this case, just to, another to delay the context, in the days, before, weeks before, you had large numbers of Russian forces massing on the Ukrainian border. You had, an, a, you had the Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group that was in the Eastern Med, Mediterranean at this time. And the Pentagon, interestingly, towards the end of the Suez blockage uh, on the 29th of March, actually said that there were operational implications. And it was that Carrier Strike Group, because if you look at the maps of where in the open source, it had to get into the Indian Ocean and relieve another carrier strike group so that, you know, could get back home or go on to next task. And so there was an implication, uh, more of an inconvenience, I would say, of a few, of a, of a couple of weeks of sailor's liberty, maybe. But if there was a crisis in South Asia uh, or, a, you know, or a crisis in the uh, East Asia, then that could have severe implications. That carrier probably would have started driving around Africa. And so conscious for time, I think I'll stop there and, and turn it back to you, Jill. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. I think there's a lot to talk about there. Hopefully we'll get to, you know, dissect the differences between what was an inconvenience, inconvenience from a security perspective versus a really big hit on the international trade community. Um, but on that note, let's turn to Lucy Duncan. Lucy is the president and CEO of Safe Ports. And uh, we know that the shipping companies really are the backbone of international trade here. So I'd like your thoughts on how they conceive of safety, security, and stability of international trade and what the effect of the accident was. I always forget that mute button, you know? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so honored to be here, especially between Brent and John and all of you at the university. Um, from our perspective, we actually look at safety as our number one thing. And of course, with this particular event, we saw this as largely a weather event. <clears throat> the question is how much human error went into this weather event. So just for everyone's knowledge, if you don't mind, I wrote down some notes so I wouldn't veer too far off course, no pun intended, um, to talk about the weather and what was happening that day. So I'm gonna read what I wrote so that I don't um, get lost in this. So he said, for a week, the world was gripped by the extraordinary sight of a massive container ship that had run aground in the Suez Canal. 
The Ever Given is 1,312 feet long. She weighs 200,000 tons with a maximum capacity of 20,000 containers. It was carrying 18,300 containers at the time. Efforts to free it finally did pay off and it was partially dislodged on the morning of Monday the 29th of March. The vessel was subsequently impounded by the Egyptian government on the 13th of April for refusing to pay a US fee of $916 million in fees demanded by the government of Egypt, a claim that is being deemed unjustified by the insurers. The financial ramifications of this are also a very large ripple effect in our industry. When we ask what caused this event, the government of Egypt requires ships traversing the canal to be boarded by an Egyptian Suez crew, including one or more official maritime pilots who command the ship taking over from the regular crew and the captain. There were two Egyptian pilots on board at the time of the accident. Cold, a cold front had swept across Egypt on March 23rd with powerful winds of about 35 miles an hour blowing along the axis of the Red Sea to the south southeast into the southern end of the Suez. The Ever Given became stuck that day. According to analysis, a sharp wind shift with winds blowing out of the southwest to west was present near the spot where the Ever Given blocked the canal about five miles north of its connection to the Red Sea. The New York Times reported that winds in excess of 70 miles per hour blew in the region where she became stuck. The owner of the ship said that the initial investigations did suggest the vessel grounded due to the strong wind and also lack of visibility from sand. The winds this strong are uncommon in this region. And as I had mentioned to all of you, I've been working in the Middle East for almost 30 years and can attest to that. However, these strong winds not only delayed shipping traffic or closed the Suez Canal on two other occasions since 2010. Ever given plat passed very close to the northwest bank of the canal at the start of its traverse, presumably pushed by these strong winds blowing into the canal entrance from the Red Sea. For unknown reasons, the ship was going faster than it should have been. She was at 15 miles per hour, which is way above its 10 is the limit. They don't really know why. The Financial Times says that when the ship got too close to the bank, shallow water hydrodynamic forces may have acted to spin the boat, a well-known phenomenon known as the bank effect where the water speeds up between the boat and the bank, pressure drops and the stern is pulled into the bank while the bow is pushed away from the shore. Possibly because of the bank effect, the ship slewed close to the opposite side of the canal and finally ran aground with its stern on the west bank of the bow and the bow on the east bank. Well, some people are now trying to connect all of that activity to climate change. And so people are saying, you know, this should be a warning that climate change could be responsible for an increase in extreme events that will impact critical global uh, choke points. So when we look at the choke points that are at risk of, of, of closure, one of the things we think about, of course, is weather, of course. But then you say, well, is there a sea level rise component to this? We also look at security and conflict hazards from war, political instability, piracy, organized crime, and or terrorism. And the final is decisions by authorities to close a choke point, as we've seen threats with the Straits of Hormuz or to restrict the passage of ships for any reason. Rising sea levels, everyone seems to agree, could threaten the integrity of port operations and coastal storage infrastructure and increase vulnerability to storm surges. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. That is a big reality here, where our harbor is only a mile and a half off of the buoy. In this particular case, while there are certain threats for operations in the Red Sea, the threat inside the Suez Canal is the same for all ships cr crossing there. All ships wait in the area as the Suez Canal transits are conducted in convoys. Potential security threats are often highlighted as worst case scenarios, namely terrorist attacks, which can cause high levels of economic disruption. These types of dynamic events have often been identified as particular threats in the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, the Gulf of Oman, the Strait of Malacca between the Malay Peninsula and Indonesian island of Sumatra, 
the Panama Canal, and of course, the Suez. However, accidents, which are highly static events, are more likely to occur. And even though this one is a rare accident, the commercial implications for the shipping industry and by extension, global trade are significant. And of course, for the military, we have to be extremely concerned. Countermeasures that are designed to increase resilience to accidents, I believe need more attention. In 2020, 19,000 ships passed through the Suez or slightly more than 50 per day, equaling 12% of global trade or $9.6 billion of goods pass through that 120 mile waterway every day. The Ever Given was sailing from China to Rotterdam as she's too large to call on many ports in the world. The plan was to unload her and then reload her to smaller ships bound for Europe and the United States. It took 10 tugboats and specialized dredging to free that ship and over one week of work. So what was the cascade effect? Well, many people that I talk to say it's gonna take at least 60 days, and I think maybe more, to undo that cascade effect. As more than 400 ships in total on both sides of the canal and inside the canal had to be delayed. This is now creating congestion at many ports in the United States and other places. As vessels are not in the right place at the right time for their next scheduled journeys. Container shortages, of course, have also plagued us during the pandemic. Challenges of just-in-time uh, assembly lines have been idled because parts are not arriving as scheduled. Factories need raw materials and shops need goods to sell and refineries need crude oil. The traffic jam doesn't allow for a single reset and restart as the entire global supply chain system has to be reset when this happens. And that takes global coordination of the security and safety and commercial and military players. Supply chain economists are disagreeing on the economic impact. Some say it will affect pricing only in Europe. Others are saying, no, it will affect pricing here. I can tell you, I have a horse farm. The price of wood for fencing has gone up $2 a board. So it's definitely affecting us. When we look at other sea routes, and I know my colleagues can speak much more about this, from a commercial perspective, it, take, it can add two weeks to a journey to go around Africa. Piracy has also been a big problem for operators of merchant ships, as we all know from the issues in Somalia, which some people say is, um, it's been dampened, but it's not over yet. Um, we are all concerned about um, piracy, of course, but also the additional cost incurred going around the Cape is related to the extra fuel consumption, also extra capacity required and related insurance premiums in order to lift the same quantum of cargo in the same amount of time. Conversely, the cost incurred in going through the Suez Canal consists of canal tolls, extra insurance and risk premiums, and the use of services such as the tugs and the pilots and mooring. So my summary, this was a rare event. We should all be paying attention to what the specialists are saying or not saying regarding global warming. But I do believe we will see increases of failures such as this worldwide. And this will, you know, we saw it last summer with the heat causing rail lines to buckle right here in the Southeast. So I think our solutions will be driven by increased awareness and resiliency. So thank you very much for letting me speak today. Thanks so much for your opening statement, Lucy. That was a fantastic rundown. And I also think a really good reminder for us, as we look at the maritime uh, community, I think one of the things that makes us more unique, and you can argue this on some other components, but even the tactical things, the bank effect, that when you talk about tugs, that can have direct strategic implications to what we're doing. And so running into the details of what happened during the accident is a really good stage setter for what those trickle down effects are. Uh, so let me shift now to our, our last panelist, John Leonard, uh, another George Mason alumni. He is the executive director of trade policy and programs at Customs and Border Protection. Thank you for joining us, John. Let me ask you from your view um, with the United States government and CBP in particular, what's the role of the Department of Homeland Security uh, in protecting the supply chain and preventing disruptions, whether they are man-made uh, or user error problems, uh, accidents, so to speak, or if uh, they're more nefarious or, or natural events. How do you conceive of the role of the United States government in this particular case, DHS and CBP? 
Sure. Thank, thanks so much, Jill, and, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to join the panel and, and speak. Um, so just a little background um, from my perspective, you know, when I when I graduated from um, uh, fr from ICP at GMU, it was, it was kind of in the mid 2000s, I was on my my first tour at headquarters uh, for Customs and Border Protection. Um, and shortly thereafter, I, I went out, took an assignment as our, our port director in San Francisco, uh, covering all of Northern California, including the Oakland Seaport. And then later I went, I went as our attache in, in Singapore, which is the largest transshipment hub in the world for maritime containers. So I've, I've had some, some good experiences in the, in the maritime uh, kind of space. Um, but, you know, Customs and Border Protection, uh, we are the largest law enforcement agency in the United States. And we, we had to have a unique and very broad mission set to protect our, our borders uh, from threats, be it terrorism, be it trade compliance issues, be it uh, we have an agricultural mission as well to prevent you know, pests and bugs, diseases from coming in. So it's a, a real unique and broad mission set for a, uh, for a border agency, actually unique in the world. Um, only Australia sort of mimics what we do, but generally, no agency has this kind of broad um, responsibility. So kind of narrowing it down to the, to the vessel and maritime uh, mission set, we, um, we use what we call a layered approach. So, you know, when you've got goods, say, made in China, um, and, and they're going to eventually travel to a, uh, to a seaport uh, to be laden on a container and then eventually, um, uh, you know, bound for the United States, we, we start getting advanced data on what's in that box, um, oftentimes, well, a minimum of 24 hours before lading in the foreign port, but often before that. So we're able to start doing our screening way, way before that, that container is, is put on the steamship and, and, and sent to the, you know, and embarking to the United States. We also employ um, a, a physical presence in 58 of the largest ports all around the world. This is what's known as our container security initiative. So when I was out in Singapore, we had three officers that, that are permanently stationed there at the seaport. Again, this is the second largest transshipment hub in the world, an incredibly busy place, 60 million TEUs a year. And what they do is they screen all the cargo that's bound for the US out of that, that port, um, looking for primarily security th threats, but also now looking for other trade compliance issues, counterfeit goods, et cetera. Um, and so that's added into that layered strategy. And all this data goes into what's known as our automated targeting system. And so by the time that container reaches, say, Charleston, South Carolina, where Lucy's at, right, or, or LA Long Beach or my old port in Oakland, we've got a pretty good idea what's in it, right, what's in the box, and, and do we want to examine it further. And doing that is quite an expensive proposition for an importer. They bear the cost, by the way. So for, to give you an example, back in, back in Oakland, uh, if we're going to look at a container and completely what we, what we call devan it, take all the goods out of it to, to do a full inspection, um, those, that, that container needs to be drayed across town, all the way across Oakland to a container examination station. The warehouse personnel uh, uh, empty it all out, and then our, our Customs and Border Protection officers examine it. And that could be a lot of money. It can be up to $2,500 and all the time lost for the importer. So they have a, a, a real incentive to be compliant. And so, um, you know, doing that, what we call intensive exam is sort of like, uh, we try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, we also uh, um, have a, a, a great array of what we call non-intrusive inspection equipment where we can x-ray containers and, and not have to open it up. Um, finally, every single container that comes into the United States without fail um, goes to a radiation portal before it leaves the yard. And so at a very minimum, we know there's no, God forbid, nuclear type of material in there or, or a bomb, nuclear bomb or device, et cetera. So it's a really multi-layered approach. So by the time that container is, is released by Customs and Border Protection and is heading to Target, Walmart, you name it, um, we've got a pretty good sense that, that the, the goods inside it are safe and compliant. Uh, but again, the volume is staggering and, and we do our best to, to try to screen and keep up with everything. Um, just by way of, of, uh, of wrapping up my, my, my intro piece here, um, 
the Suez Canal, as Lucy said, is having a little bit of effect on, on our volume, but even bigger than that, the whole COVID reset uh, caused a lot of problems and continues to cause a lot of problems, in particular at our busiest seaport uh, of the ports of Los Angeles and the port of Long Beach, whereby vessels are out at anchorage, uh, I mean, hundreds of them waiting to, to, to queue up and, and unload. And it's just, it's just a, a, a a case of, of, of overcapacity and, and sailings happening after factories had been shut down. And, and now the, the Chinese factories and other Asian factories are, are humming along. So it's just a, it's just a, a, a kind of a supply chain uh, redirect thing that needs to, needs to work itself out and, and unfortunately takes time. I'll also give an, an anecdote um, from my time in Singapore where you know, acts of nature uh, can, can really affect uh, maritime cargo. So Singapore will experience from time to time a haze that comes over from Malay from us uh, from Indonesia rather, literally blankets the country um, and, and you can hardly see anything and the air quality is very bad. It got so bad in, in 2013 that the port of Singapore actually had to close down maritime operations for 24 hours. And it sounds like, wow, that's not much, but it actually messed up their their logistics for the following six months after that. Can you imagine that? Like shutting down for just 24 hours messed up things for for months ahead so so these things can happen and it, and obviously if if importers carrier steamship lines etc try to try to plan for these contingencies but it is very difficult and hard to predict so happy to continue the discussion and again thank you for the opportunity thanks john i appreciate it um you know you you sort of rounded out our discussion of all the different players that are involved in this very complicated uh maritime security arena from U.S. and foreign militaries to private shipping companies to insurers to you know government agencies and 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 the weather is its own player, right? <laughs> um, I think what I'd like to do you, you mentioned this right at the tail end, so to open up this broader discussion, uh, let's launch on on the the notion of what we are looking at post COVID. So Lucy mentioned that this accident was a rare one. Uh, it was a confluence of events that may or may not happen again, uh, but it was very unlikely and uncommon for the region. Uh, but we are we are coming off of a year of uh, and a shutdown for a global pandemic that had vast implications. So when you think about that from the different perspectives you represent, uh, how do you conceive or do you conceive of the stability of the supply chain and international commerce as a security threat? Um, I guess, let me kick it back to Brent. Can you talk about uh, what that looks like from your perspective, uh, given you know what we've had to deal with the last year? Uh, certainly. So. Um... From the military, or at least from Navy, uh, the COVID implications are have pretty much worked themselves out in the first several months of the uh, pandemic. Uh, but the but I would kind of go harken back and say that there was a supply issue with PPE that had this occurred in like late January of 2020, uh, there could have been some severe uh, ramifications then. In other words, delivering supplies, PPE, and oxygen. Well, now we have India that needs uh, oxygen cylinders. And so there could have been a very direct human cost. And uh, again, if you overlay that with the security implications, I mean, there's a corollary there, um, but health and security kind of make them look at them as the same way in this kind of dynamic. Uh, there is another aspect of this as well, that, it's, that I think even COVID or no COVID, uh, if when you have a blockage at a strategic choke point, and the military is visibly impacted, there's a reputational aspect of that. Can the United States honor its security commitments? Um, and those questions, the longer that that, that that blockage is not mitigated, the more severe that strategic questioning starts to come. So there's a, that's, a, that's a lingering issue. And I would say that there are others in other countries that are in, the, in other navies also looking that, at that as well and looking at their planning to make sure that there's mitigations, even though we're only talking about five to seven days on, on a back of the envelope kind of calculation. There are a lot of things that go into that. Um, the other part of this that we probably, probably worth talking about is the capacity to actually clear the consequence management. Uh, there, this hasn't come up in the discussions uh, to date yet, and uh, I'm hopeful that it will. And this is those specialized tugs that I talked about earlier, as well as the uh, suction dredgers. Uh, and I'd also mention there's a legal aspect of this. There's still 25 sailors, Indian sailors from the Japanese owned ship, the Ever Given, 
uh, that are still being held for payment. So there's a, there's, a, there's a maritime legal aspect too, which I'm not so sure how it plays yet in the military, but if we had a contracted ship and we had uh, foreign nationals that are sailing it with military supplies on it, that does have some implications too to consider. And I haven't heard that cut brought up yet in, in my circles. So I'll give it back to you, Jill. Fair enough, thank you. Um, Lucy, from your perspective, how, how do you think about the stability of international commerce and, and uh, you know, whether that is a result of a, a weather event or, um, or COVID? You're on mute again, Lucy. You know, my husband is looking for a mute button for me. <laughs> And I don't know why I always turn it off when I'm working and then I don't turn it off at home. Anyway, um, I laugh when I think about how acts of nature come up suddenly, they're unpredictable, things move around very quickly. And I think about the hurricanes here on the East Coast of the United States a lot. But in this case, what I'm really more concerned about is biosecurity and biosafety and going into the food chain supply, the medical supply, those things which keep our world safe again. And how are we going to address this? Because we have become so dependent on multimodal transportation. We've become so interrelated in these issues that we can't just shift to air and think we can just move that cargo by air because air is at many times already at capacity anyway. So as logisticians, I began to think, have we gone the wrong direction by making these ships so large? They, the Suez Canal was not designed for ships this large, and they don't have the ability to widen the canal much like uh, Panama has so successfully done. So part of this, I look back, and as I said, it's a biosecurity question to me or a biosafety question to me. And that is to say, if I have mission critical goods and services that must move around this planet and not get stuck in choke points, what are they? And where can I be stockpiling them ahead of time? Um, my company, our core business is defense logistics. We've been serving our US military in war zones for 20 years now. And one of my big problems in Afghanistan was when the port of Karachi was blockaded. We weren't allowed to move cargo the way we needed to. We had 2,000 containers frustrated in Karachi, yet we had war fighters who needed the equipment that was in those containers. And I can tell you many sleepless nights later, we got through it. When I look now, and I think like Brent was saying with the PPE equipment, almost want to look at the, the um, resiliency globally on those things which are considered mission critical to be prepared for disasters. So when issues like this occur, we're not scrambling and thinking, oh my gosh. So I think we got lucky on this one. I think this was a wake up call. It could have been a whole lot worse. And I also think we should re-examine the size of the ships that are permitted to go through the Suez Canal for obvious reasons, particularly when there's high winds. And I don't understand why the Egyptian government or Egyptian, you know, the, those in charge of the Suez Canal itself allowed that ship to get into that canal knowing they were having wind and sandstorms at the time. Um, and I think that there has to be some you know, shared responsibility on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think there is that natural tension between uh, stockpiling and just-in-time logistics uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to emergencies and, and mitigation efforts. Uh, John, from your perspective, um, you know, how do you how, how do you think the U.S. government is um, adept at managing uh, hiccups or longer-term implications for disruptions to the supply chain? Thanks. Yeah, and I'll I'll hit on points that that both Brent and and Lucy made. So. <clears throat> When we have emergencies, right, like like COVID, um, Customs and Border Protection and other federal agencies do everything we can within our authorities to expedite and and, and try to um, help things move along. So, for instance, with the with the personal protective equipment, is whenever um, the pandemic began, we immediately took steps to to expedite shipments of those goods into the United States, and that was a, a huge effort in the early months of the pandemic. On the back end, we also expedited and continue to expedite literally every day um, shipments of vaccines coming in. So we're handling both ends of that. From a kind of a, a stepping back into a more of a, um, a, a 
a trade policy type of, of um, a discussion re regarding supply chains. You know, both administrations, the, the previous administration, and the current administration, both take uh, make policy decisions that, that Customs and Border Protection executes that, that try to prevent or, or put the United States in the best position to deal with these types of, of shortages. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one is in, in, uh, in the steel and aluminum industry. So CBP has been, been collecting tariffs on steel and aluminum for about almost two and a half years now. Uh, a pretty substantial tariff of 25% of, uh, on, on steel items and 10% on aluminum items from most countries. And um, the rationale for doing so, interestingly enough, is national security. Um, the, the Trump administration and now continued by the Biden administration feel that if a country does not have um, a steel and aluminum industry, that is a threat to our national security. And, and we, we carry that out. And now you'll, you'll have issues with all kinds of, of different sectors of industry. Like for instance, now there's a great shortage of semiconductors for this country. And, and you know, we're seeing automotive companies having to idle or, or even stop supply, uh, you know, um, th their, their manufacturing lines because they don't have chips that they need for the, for the vehicles. And so some of those things, Customs and Border Protection can't influence if, if just the, there's a shortage from the foreign country or, or worldwide supply chains, but where we can, we step in and expedite. And our masters up on the Hill and in the White House will, will, will execute or have us execute larger trade policies that have longer term effects, such as that steel and aluminum issue that I mentioned. So, so yeah, it's, it's a very interesting and dynamic tra time for international trade. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would like to ask one more question, and then I'm going to turn to audience Q&A uh, as they, they roll in. So I, let me go backwards, Lucy, to you and then to Brent. Um, we have talked about the different organizations and players in this arena. Uh, when this is a, the Shark School is policy and government, so we're looking at policy options, but it also could be, um, you know, in, imperatives put forward by the private sector. So from those who are responsible for making change, what do you see as steps we could take to mitigate against future accidents, whether they're um, natural accidents or, or man-made? Okay, in this one location in the Suez Canal, when you have so many ships per day, you have 50 ships per day, this is a global passageway that has to remain open. And yet it is not wide enough for ships to be able to pass one another or get around one another. And you also have these behemoth ships that have been created to move more cargo on one vessel and then break it down into smaller vessels to then move to other ports that can handle those vessels. I think it's a grave mistake to allow ships of this size to enter the Suez Canal on days where you have high wind, period, full stop. And I think that what it has done is wake us up to the fact that these great big ships are marvelous when it works. Here in Charleston, we've had to dredge to get much deeper. We had to build a new bridge to get much higher so that ships could enter the port of Charleston, be able to turn around on low tide and get out of the port of Charleston so that we would not have a blockage like this. And even so, we probably really aren't prepared for them. So we kind of do this and think it'll all work out. So I do think part of it is in the maritime industry to police itself and to say, hey guys, we can't let this happen. The second, I think, is as John Leonard was saying so correctly, he can see way out, but I think probably 72 hours or more exactly what is heading into the US. And if there are critical things coming in that have now gone through this delay in Egypt, how to coordinate best to get that mission critical cargo in and out of our ports so that they're not hung up like we're seeing in LA Long Beach, trying to get through the slowdown created by the pandemic. Um, so I think it's a common sense approach. And I think that all of us need to work together with a common sense approach to say, this is a time we have to work together internationally and nationally. Great, thanks. Brent, who's responsible? Who should take action? What should they do? So um, there's a couple that I, I, I kind of want to also get to the embassy's role in, in these countries where they, that are resident in these critical choke points as well. Uh, but from, 
from my perspective as a Navy guy, it really should be the business, like the free market trends. You know, if you have a business and your business is the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal, it's in your best interest to maximize the flow and the speedy flow of commerce through, through your canal, because that's income. That's directly direct correlation to income. So you're making profit. The Suez Canal is a critical source for foreign capital for the government in Cairo. In Panama, the, the canal is, is directly related to, if not the majority of its income or GDP, it's certainly above 40%. So it's a significant influencer. And Singapore is a, is a metropole that's founded on transshipment and trade. So these are places that are in the best interest. So let the free markets, but hold them accountable. And, and the accountability, the, the responsibility, I'd say the responsibility in the case of the Ever Given, uh, the, it was it still kind of astounds me that the pilots didn't make the ship not enter given the conditions. So I'm with Lucy on that a, a thousand percent. And the captain of the ship should be held accountable for not vetoing the pilots and turning around. And my personal experience, I've gone through the Panama Canal twice on a, on a submarine. That's not something that happens normally. And the pilots had no idea. We were the first ones to go through. So uh, I've used emergency backing bells only two times in my life on a submarine, 26 years on a submarine, both times in the Panama Canal. Um, and that's close quarters. So I, I echo that concern that it's really also on, it's at the end of the day, it's on the captain of the ship. But at the other side of this, why did the canal authorities or operators not have the capacity to clear the vessels that they are authorizing and taking money to go through the canal. So in the end of the day, there's, a, there's gonna be some litigation that's, that's, that's gonna to have to unfold. But if the Suez Canal is not held accountable for, for its actions, I think there's, there's gonna be a disservice there. And what I mean by that is they should have had those resources in place, not the ever given or the sailors uh, totally responsible. So this $916 million lawsuit, there's a bur burden also, I think, on the Suez Authority. And that comes back to the role of the embassies and the attaches. Um, there was once upon a time much more capacity forward and in country overseas. In Panama, we actually had a military presence that could also facilitate some of this protection um, and some of this oversight if you had to clear the canal. Never the case in Suez and certainly not the case in Panama today. But those attaches, you also had a fleet liaison officer who would actually be there on the waterfront to help facilitate movement through these uh, the, ac the economic and the per permissions that are required uh, going through these canals. And now you're relying on one or two folks in an embassy who are overwhelmed doing the attache job. So this is really just them pushing the paperwork, making sure thing, the dot, basically all the, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and then moving on. Um, so there's probably, a on the military side, there's going to be a need, I hope, that comes out of uh, recapitalizing their presence in these critical choke points in the embassies and helping the attaches. Uh, the other part of it is, is the attaches work with the canal, canal authorities to make sure there are adequate security measures put in place. That's, a, that's an agreement between both the Navy and the, the canal authorities, both in Panama and Suez. They're different, but the dynamics the same. And it's the attache that's that, that connector. Uh, in some places, you have Coast Guard liaisons as well. Uh, and they play. A, they they don't really play in this role as much. Uh, it's really the naval attaché. Um, so I hope that answers the question. But I, I definitely wanted to make that 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 connection that there's a business imperative for them to have this capacity to clear these vessels. I mean, they had to call the Italians, and I think there was a Dutch uh, tugs with enough bollard pull weight to pull the Evergreven off the ground. So I, I think I, hopefully I didn't talk too long, but I hope that answered your question, Jill. A lot of folks responsible and, and have uh, some some ability to take action. John, uh, other thoughts on this before we shift to the audience Q and A. Uh, just real briefly off Brent's comments, you know, we're, we're blessed in certain parts of the world to have a, a strong attaché presence. Like in Singapore, we had the Navy has the Seventh Fleet has such a pronounced presence uh, in that uh, in that region and in the embassy specifically. Um, and so I guess it it really is a region by region kind of need and 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 it. I think it is would be smart to, to kind of reassess, especially those critical choke point areas. Obviously, the Straits of Malacca absolutely are, and we have 
people there and, and presence there, but uh, in, in other places, maybe we could, we could stand to kind of uh, increase it a bit. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. So let me open this up and, and these are open to any panelists, but um, I, I asked maybe we can keep our, our responses short so we can get through as many as possible. We have several questions rolling in. So the first is from Kenneth Reinert. Uh, the security community appears to be very much aware of climate change issues, but the political community is not necessarily so. Are there ways the security community can help bring the political community up to speed by emphasizing the commercial and security risks of climate change? So, uh, Lucy, you want to kick us start? You you started with uh, climate change in your comment. I love that question. Thank you. That is a terrific question. And the reason it really makes me happy to hear that question is if all parties are not working together, we are working against each other. And we have to work together. Um, I don't think that the political question should ever be out in front. It really needs to be about what if scenarios. And like we saw in Charleston three summers ago, I think we had Hurricane Florence barreling toward us and it was gonna be the worst storm ever. And all of the ships at the port of Charleston had to leave and all of us had to get everything out, right? And then Florence decided not to come at all and went somewhere else. So all of this pause and restore and build it up and take it down and build it up and take it down. And the fear factor is horrible. In the case of the Suez, as I said, it was an unusual event between the high, high, high temperatures they'd been having the week before, which drove a lot of dryness in the desert, which drove a lot more sand in the air, which reduced visibility. It's like this event going down, down, down. Well, absolutely. Call it climate change, call it climate reality, whatever you want to call it. The reality is these cataclysmic events came together and yet the government, and I would say it's probably the Egyptian Navy at the end of the day, should have either paused and restored activity in the canal that day, or certainly paused the larger ships from getting into the canal that day. So that integration of government and private sector, you can be sure private sector would be screaming mad saying, no, 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 we've got deadlines to make, we can do this, but at some point, there has to be an adult in the room to say no, because the ramifications to too many other folks is too great. So I love this question, and I really hope that we will see in the coming days, weeks, and years ahead a much more robust conversation about what I call climate reality. And let's plan for these events in better ways so that we don't have these cataclysmic events occur. And God knows this one could have been so much worse. So thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Brent, John, thoughts on uh, climate change and the commercial risks? Um, I, I guess from an operational perspective, it's for 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 a Navy and maybe to a lesser extent Coast, well, Coast Guard probably more directly uh, for lifesaving. I mean, if you can't, if the weather patterns are changing into ways that you're not, that you that your prediction models are not as accurate, then that's a problem of consequence management because you need to move your forces, you need to move your assets or closer or further away from where the problem's gonna be driven by natural occurrences. The hurricanes uh, are one example. Um, so I, that that's kind of troubling, but it's something that seems to be moving at a speed at which at least the Navy can can adjust to. Um, Coast Guard, I'm, I'm not as sure because their capacities are more closer and into life-saving. They may be more impacted by this directly than say the Navy. and that I had, that carries lesser strategic implications. But. Okay, we have another question here on weather. Um, and I, I guess the question is, would standardizing port conditions, uh, call signals around the world impact the speed with which port security apparatus can restrict traffic, control traffic and communicate? Um, Thoughts on that, and that is from Alicia Bankston. Lucy, do you want to take that one? That might be sure, more I, on your yeah. lane. I mean, well, I can talk from a Navy. Again, plan. yes. Well, I think we're all interrelated at the end of the day. So, Jill, just to make sure I'm understanding this question, could you give it to me one more time? 
Sure can. Uh, and I think really this is about standardization of port conditions and, and who makes the call on restricting traffic, controlling traffic. Um, uh, we had hurricane season port conditions and categories, what it looks like, who determines uh, what, when, um, how, how does that work? Is there is it standardized right now? I, I think okay. the assumption is that it's not. Uh, no. Would it help to standardize that kind of information? Okay, perfect. So um, the question is a great one because weather events are all different. You know, right now we're dealing with a volcano in the Southern Caribbean, which has really wrecked havoc on shipping. Um, so how do you plan for a you know a tornado? Oh, excuse me, uh, a volcano's ash to be creating a climate event in the Caribbean, it happens. When we think about seaports, you have all kinds of ports. You have river ports, you have deep sea ports, you have smaller ports, you have ports in many different countries. I worked in Mexico, we had 21 federal ports in Mexico, yet there are many other privately run ports. When we deal in the United States, we have state port authority ports, but we also have seaports which act just like landlords and it's the terminal operators who are actually running the show. Um, so globally, it's really hard to say what would the global protocol look like, which is why I always go back to common sense. Hopefully there's lots of it. And when you look at the geographic conditions at seaports around the world, one of the things you'll see like in LA Long Beach and their inland port with the Alameda Corridor versus our seaports where everything is heading out to I-95 basically. So our ports act in an intermodal or multimodal way and they act according to the geography that they're in and they act according to the governance that has been set up for generations above them. I think New York, New Jersey is a really great example of how two states at least streamlined a lot of their authorities. So the answer is, it is a Rubik's cube of behaviors at different ports. It's also driven by people. You know, people have different perspectives. So you may go to uh, one port where everything they think about is velocity, agility, let's get these ships in, get them out, get them in, get them out. They will invest enormous amounts of money in infrastructure with cranes and on-site rail to move their cargo really, really fast. And then you'll deal with other ports like the Port of Cortez down in Honduras that is the exact opposite. It's inside of a colonial environment where the ships come in, the trucks are just a mishmash everywhere and it's just a mess. And of course we suspect there's a lot of illicit drug activity going on down there. So some people say they won't fix it because of other business quote unquote interest. We have other ports that are cruise ship ports. And all they're thinking about is the passenger's experience. And of course, with the pandemic, our cruise ship industry has been decimated and is most anxious to come back. So what are they looking at? So I think we will never see true standardization, but we do have a lot of industry associations where the shipping owners talk to each other. We have BIMCO and other really big ones that are like global lobbying groups for ship owners. We have port authorities in different countries that work very closely with John's team because they're looking at implementing programs that our Customs and Border Control want, like CTPAT, and Know Your Customer, and all those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, you're at the mercy of that port director and the hierarchical environment of his or her country and how they are going to implement port security and port safety. And that is just the way the world is. I don't see that ever changing. And I think the EU has tried to standardize probably more than any other region, um, but that's about it. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate that. It's a very complicated web uh, once mm. you dive into jurisdictional areas. Uh, let's shift radically away from weather. Uh, we've got five minutes left in this panel, but we got a question from Brendan Wolfel. Uh, to what degree is the maritime shipping industry exposed to the same kind of cyber threats that other <laughs> industries might face? What does that picture look like? Uh, and uh, if anyone wants to go first, please hop in. Yeah, I'll take a shot at it. <clears throat> so um, like just about every industry that exists today, 
uh, everything is is IT centric, right? So so for the maritime industry and its connection with with customs and border protection and and importers, exporters, freight forwarders, everybody's connected uh, online. Um, all of the data that I talked about is transmitted online. Uh, that's the way we we get our declaration. That's the way uh, CBP actually collects the revenue, the over eighty billion dollars in revenue that we collect every year. And so any type of cyber threat, um, be it to the government side or to the private sector side, can have a, a catastrophic effect. And obviously both sides, I can speak for, for DHS and CBP, take um, really, really aggressive steps to, to protect our, our infrastructure uh, and, and from cyber threats. It's a daily uh, kind of cadence we do. Um, and I, I know on the private side, uh, all the carriers, importers, exporters, uh, steamship lines, et cetera, do the same. So it, it is a constant battle uh, for to to ward off these threats. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think what we'd like to do, we just have just a couple minutes. Uh, I will pose one question and have the three of you answer and we'll wrap it up after that. But we do have a question from an anonymous attendee. We do have students online who are looking to break into the maritime security or logistics field. What are you looking for in a candidate and uh, any closing comments you have for our panel today? Let's start with Brent. Uh, so if you wanna get into the maritime industry, I can only talk to uh, really the military and maybe some of the security uh, organizations associated with that. Uh, I guess the first thing is uh, uh, learn your ship. <laughs> That's the most important thing is understand your profession and your trade. So you have to love the ocean first and foremost. And then the second one is you gotta be kind of a people person because the weather and the, the port authorities are gonna have to, there, there are other people on the other side of the world. So you have to have an affinity for working with very diverse groups of people. Uh, so I would say those two things. Thank you, appreciate that. Lucy, thoughts? Uh, well, since we're always hiring, <laughs> I, I would think that um, in our world of supply chain logistics, a lot of our work happens on the land. So we are looking for warehouse managers, inventory managers, quality control managers, people that really understand how to offload the ship and reload the ship. In Guam, our job was to take care of our Pacific fleet, and we were super agile in our approach. Um, and other ports were at the lim you know were limited by geography and other things. So I would say candidates that want to be in this industry need to be very very detail oriented. As Brent said, absolutely people 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 uh, skills, and they have to not be afraid of working overtime long hours because when a surge happens, it happens, and all hands on deck. So especially in disaster relief and, and preparedness and defense logistics, we don't take days off. We will we'll work four or five months at a time and then take a month off. Um, so the defense logistics industry is a great one and I encourage people to look into it. Um, and in the commercial side, the logistics business, Amazon has proven you can't hire enough people. It's just a, a business that is flourishing. Yeah, you gotta move to drones. Uh, John yeah. Leonard, uh, other th the thoughts on uh, how to break into this field for our students yeah. online? Yep, I'll keep it real quick because I know we're we're coming up against time. I'll and I'll make it very easy. Go for CBP. Go to USA Jobs. We are hiring customs and border protection officer, border patrol agent, air and marine officer, international trade specialist, which is more my lane. But uh, USA Jobs and look for customs and border protection. Well, that's a good, that's a good plug, probably a nice one to end on. Um, we are at the top of the hour. I, let me just add some closing comments. There's a few other questions that came in. I I'm sure we didn't get to them, but hopefully we'll be able to follow up via email. Um, but it, it is, there's a great concern over the, the ability for folks to coordinate in this arena. How does the Navy and the Coast Guard work with the Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection? And is the industry in the room when we're having those conversations? And what is the interplay between the secure, security aspects that we, we need to, as a country, worry about, uh, as well as the international trade and commerce perspectives um, and, and whether those communities are talking. Uh, again, that's one of our goals today was to make sure we open the doors between those lanes. Uh, and I do encourage us to continue to have conversations like this as we move forward to bring the folks together that have a need to know and to share and collaborate on key issues of maritime security. So thank you to the audience for being here today. Thank you very much to our esteemed panelists. 
uh, and Dean Rizal for, for joining us this, this noon time and a blustery day in Northern Virginia. Um, with that, I, I think uh, we are closing and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, everybody. It's very good. Take care.